Welcome and good afternoon on this third day of A New Hope. <laughs> we just want to let everyone know we would love to hear any comments you had about your experience here, whether in li real life or virtually, whether positive or negative. Please remember we will read all of your comments. Please send them to feedback at hope.net, feedback at hope.net. And on to our next speaker. Why in the world are school districts across the country seeking out covert, unaccountable means of gathering intelligence on their students and people close to them? That is the question that our next speaker, Harry Jackson, will answer. All right, well, hello, Hope. It's my third conference being here. I love, love coming in here. How many of you are parents? How many of you have kids in public schools? Yeah, you guys are gonna to wanna to hear this one. So, uh, my name is Harry Jackson. Uh, I'm a parent advocate with Parents Defending Education. It's a, it's a nonprofit, bipartisan. But uh, we've been making a lot of noise. So we're gonna talk about, like we're gonna talk about uh, this afternoon. Give you a brief introduction. I'll tell you a little bit about who I am, how I, my origin story. How did I come into this fight, which I didn't expect to be in? Um, the evolution, a literal war on parents. I'm sure most of you have been following what's been going on in the media. A lot of controversy, a lot of political partisan divide with what's going on in our schools. Um, I can give you actually some insight into that. Actually, being on the front, being on the front, being on the front lines. And I'm actually glad to actually be in front of this audience specifically um, to be able to talk about like what some of the what has been hap what has been happening, why parents are reacting the way they are in certain areas of the country. I'll talk about the school social media monitoring policy, what, it's, what it was purported to actually represent, which most of us agree on, and then how they're trying to modify that to, to, to no kidding, actually create a intelligence collection platform that's not just directed at students, but towards parents or anything that might actually be associated as a threat to a brand in the schools. And we can see where that could be put potential misuse. Um, nationwide trends where this is coming out, and I'll give you an update of like what we're doing as parents, as what we're doing as parents to actually combat this. How many of you have ever seen these photos? One, you've seen these? Yeah, yeah, okay. One of them's Loudoun County, right? A lot of conservative parents. How about the one to the left? Anyone familiar with that one? That's the next county over. That's Fairfax. That's mostly minorities, mostly left-leaning. You've got a, there's a firestorm going on in Northern Virginia, and there's a big and there's a big knife fight that's going on, not between these groups, but between school boards and some of the behaviors and activities that they've been doing, and it's creating like a soup, which is creating a big, which is why a lot of parents are fighting, and you start seeing a lot of different alliances, people you would never expect to be in the same room together that are actually talking and are really pissed off. That are going to be running for that are going to be running for school boards in the, in the next in the next uh, next couple of years. All right, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Right, so I'm a whistleblower. I actually survived. See that down there? That's a BioWatch program. I actually spoke at that at the Hope in 2020, where I blew up a 2.2 billion dollar boondoggle at DHS. Uh, they tried to strip me of my security clearance. I was on the front page of the LA Times. I actually spoke about this and actually named names. Um, and I actually told people like, you know, how do you survive being a whistleblower? Like, no shit, how do you do it? Um, it sucks. So if you're gonna blow the whistle on somebody, be prepared to, you know, find something else to do. Fortunately, I did keep my, all my clearances. I actually came back and actually consulted at, uh, at DHS again. 
Um, a little bit about my background. Uh, you see up there, I used to uh, be a professor at National Intelligence University. It's where we uh, teach, I uh, taught the cyber intel as well as transnational threats in their MSSI program. I also teach at another, a couple of other universities. The University of Maryland is another one. I teach, teach cyber as well as there. My background, I talked about intel community. I started out as a human targeteer. Um, that's the person that actually develops all of those dossiers that you see in your James Bond films, determining people who have placement access and accessibility. I've also had experience as a collections manager. I've served as an attache overseas, helping to do collection operations as well. So like, you know, and living in the Washington DC area, it's the spy capital of the world. So when we start seeing like something like this happen, like pick it out pretty easily. And we have a lot of parents that are like, are also in that community, we see the same thing. We're like, okay, we're gonna do something about this. Um, so uh, actually, and I'm currently supporting, uh, I still st still support uh, three layer agencies. Right now I'm supporting FBI, I've been the chief security officer, supporting directly as the chief security officer as well as their information security officer. So I still, you know, I'm still within the community. I'm still doing the same things. I, I have survived this. So yes, my activism has not, uh, detracted from, has not uh, had a negative impact on my professional career, so I can still talk a lot of trash and get away with it. Um, so, oh, and by the way, my whistleblowing case, that's actually still open. That is still an investigation that I, that I blew the whistle on back in 2016 when you have a bunch of guys who are using uh, federal funds to go to the Olympics, um, NFL playoff games, some good old NASCAR events as well from good old Southern boys and good old good old boy network, and I blew the whistle on that. Um, one thing that I did do, uh, which um, a lot of other people I've known who blew the whistle, I actually kept receipts. Like I actually had like audio recordings, and I kept emails, and you know I kept I did keep all of that, and uh, it's kind of an interesting experience. Not a fun one, definitely not fun. But make sure that you're right if you're ever going to do that. If you're ever going to blow the whistle on something, but if you want to talk to me about that later, you know I can. I do, I do talk for beer. I get better with every beer that I drink when I want to talk about some of these stories, okay? All right. So, wow. How did I end up in some of these things? Now, don't pay too much attention to this. I mean, I'm not some anti-CRT guy. I just don't like the way how they try to implement it, which is the, really the big issue. Right. You just can't really discriminate against one group because you can't put a level of human hierarchy. You can't place a value of, uh, hum you can't put a hierarchy in human misery, you know, because every, especially in, in Fairfax, it's a very diverse area. Everyone has different issues. Um, but these are some of the things. I was actually the first uh, black president of the PTA uh, at Thomas Jefferson High School, Science and Technology, nation's number one high school. We're actually serious competition for Stuyvesant. I know I talk trash to a lot of Stuyvesant parents. I've been, a lot, I've been in contact with some New York parents here. I know New York's got a great education system. Um, so, uh, but we had a lot of challenges when we talked about uh, the changes to admissions process. Now, I'm, I'm a father, right? How many dads are really involved in like their kid's school? Okay, you got some, great, good on you. All right, now let me tell you this. Um, was it a challenge being involved? Yes, it is, right? Because it's just like, you know, you walk into, there's that hierarchy, right? I mean, I was a single dad at one point, right? And you walk in, you try to volunteer, it's almost like that hierarchy, that, uh, that alpha female um, room mom. You know what I'm talking about? Like, guys, like, who wants to volunteer? And you raise your hand, and all you hear is a grunt, and then everyone looks right to the mom who's been experienced, and she's like, oh, she's in charge. And as the dad, you're like, okay, all you're going to do is, uh, you know, if there's something heavy to lift, you go do it. I'm like, okay, fine. You know, I'll, I'll be involved in my kid's life. Uh, my kids' school and education, but um, this kind of elevated with some of the activism that we've seen down in Northern Virginia, where, um, and this is leads up to why would they implement this type of a system, where a lot of parents that started protesting uh, started getting doxxed by uh, school board, uh, by activists that have associations with the school board. Like they would actually put up a dossier and dox parents and actually try to, and, and harass them. Um, for a little bit about me, what I also do, like I also like I volunteer like a black student fund. They're trying to do, uh, integrate or desegregate independent schools. And I encountered it when I had somebody call me a oh, segregationist. I was like, what did you just say to me? So it's like kind of game on. And then down in Fairfax, Virginia, when a lot of parents started protesting um, some of the school board policies, they started up getting kicked out of their local Democratic Party. 
by school board members actually holding votes. In fact, I was just on a call an hour ago finding out, like, you know, like when people try to join, like, their local Democrat, it's mostly, it's mostly Democratic, and you find out that you're getting voted off the island. And so it's kind of like, okay, it's, it's, it's game on. Um, those are a couple of things, and I can tell you some other stories that I might interject depending on the time I have of some other crazy things that have happened. Um, so... Let's talk about schools that are monitoring social media activity. Now, most of us agree on this, um, that schools are they're legally required to have a direct plan to monitor a student's internet presence, what they're doing online using school assets and resources. Um, typically, they're only empowered to do this on school-issued emails or devices, though it varies by district, and where they might monitor other social media activity for harassment or bullying, so they can intervene. You know, I think most of us will agree on this. Now, most schools, are starting to implement social media monitoring programs under the justification to identify potential active, potential active shooters. Because you typically will have in the initial phases a preparation phase and when they actually will start acquiring the means to actually develop the attack, you have to move very quickly. Also to how for self-bullying and with self-harm for those of us that had kids in the pandemic, I'm impacted by this. I talked to a lot of other parents that are impacted by this. Like, you know, mental health is a major issue that has had, that has had an, that this uh, pandemic has had an effect. Remote learning has just been a complete disaster on our on our youth. Um, and uh, also, I mentioned here the Educator School Safety Network shows that most bomb threats come from social media. Now, let's go into the nitty gritty of this. We about definitions, right? They matter. Now, I said, like, I'm a, almost a veteran, I'm a retired Navy intel officer, so you tell me I'm going to secure a room that tells me to sweep up and close the door. You tell someone in the Army to secure a building, that means Constantine wire guns and guards secure the room. You tell someone in the Marine Corps that comes in with overwhelming force, kill everything inside. You tell someone in the Air Force secure a building, it means, oh, five-year lease with an option to buy, right? Okay, it, it's like, you know... Words really do have specific meanings, you know, depending on the community that you're talking to. So let's talk about, like, you know, the definition of a threat, right? That's a, that's a communication or behavior that you intend to harm someone. It can be spoken, written, gestured. I'm not going to read the slide so you can read it there. But then you can also do, like, a threat assessment. And coming from an intelligence background, one thing that they really, really sell to you is ICD-203, analytic standards, and making sure that you do not politicize intelligence. Things go very bad when you do that. Anyone remember Bay of Pig or read about Bay of Pigs? It was supposed to fail. <laughs> it was supposed to fail. It, it failed spectacularly, see, or Cuban Missile Crisis, right? The asteroid got back. This is where you came up with Right, but in that one, but they kept on taking away resources to, you know, because they thought, oh, they'll just take it over, and they reduced resources where it was a complete disaster. Cuban Missile Crisis classic case of mirror imaging fallacy. They're like, no, the Russians would never put ballistic missiles in, uh, medium range missiles in Cuba, because we would, we would lose our minds. You know? And the Russians were like, well, you've got Jupiter missiles in Turkey. We'll just go do the same thing to you. And we, got very, we came very close to World War III. Um, when you talk about with the threat and mentioning this process, it's you know, with the idea that gets implanted into an actor, a person who's, an act, who's, an, who's a potential actor shooter, they have the idea, and then the planning stage. And you typically don't have indications of when someone's in the planning stage. For those of us that have sliced out like the Uvalde shootings, um, even Columbine, the planning stages, that really doesn't have a lot of, of, of visibility. But when you start acquiring the means, like you're actually purchasing like an assault weapon or uh, you might you are acquiring the capability to do that. That's typically when you have that first indicator in which you require a rapid response, which is why schools have started having social media monitoring to get ideas when people are actually starting to have the I, the idea that they might want to do this to allow for inter rapid intervention. So our school policy, all right, we're the eleventh largest school district. They've got a, over a three billion dollar budget which is DOD-esque type of money, which is subject to rampant fraud, waste, and abuse. And with ESSER funds to help with pandemic learning loss, it's at $4 billion. They put an informal request for a proposal. This is what governments use when they want to acquire goods or services from contractors. Now, what's really should be concerning you about this is that Fairfax County, um, typically with a lot of other school districts around the country, will follow what Fairfax does. New York is an exception, they do what they do. Um, other states actually follow what New York does as well. 
but they will typically mirror what some of the larger school districts will do. And this put up this, form, this, this typical RFP to expand the social media research program. Now this sounds you know, benign, nothing to really worry about until you actually look at the RFP and then you start realizing like, oh my God, what are, they, what are these people thinking? Now this one was to expand it to deter, to detect or deter any negative actions or consequences from social media which may be directed to racial groups or any other student or teacher with FCPS. All right, that sounds like a legitimate term. Now I might bring in some other issues here, but other, the current process that they have, and most people wouldn't object to us, is that you know, this is already in use in other colleges and used in schools throughout the country. And for example, the use of Social Sentinel, but there's some key differences. Current social media programs do not um, access your private social media accounts. Um, they only look at private social media, which can be seen by anyone at any time. And they're not for use as an investigative tool. Now, our school board, um, some of the practices that they've had that have resulted in, well, some of the behavior that they've resulted in, I mentioned that they associate with activists that dock students, but when other actions that they have taken over recent years, like for example, if you look at Loudoun County, where before you could have like social, uh, you'd have public comment, commentary at a school board meeting, you could speak for three minutes. You can come every school board meeting, right? Most of us are familiar with that. Loudoun County, they kind of reduced that. They reduced it from three minutes to one minute. Instead of the camera being on your face, it's now towards the back of your head. They also have the presence of private security. The, so the sheriff's office will have nothing to do with it because they realize they're just trying to intimidate parents. But they'll have you walk through a metal detector as if you're going through Rikers Island. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's kind of ridiculous. Most of these people are, prof are professionals, and they're, there's, there's, they don't even meet the definition of a true threat. Um, Fairfax County, they reduce it from three minutes to two minutes, and the same thing. Back of your head, um, they're not going to let you talk if you're criticizing um, anything that you're talking about. For example, um, their the most recent would be um, a controversial policy uh, position that they have. Before it was, if you're going to talk about a controversial issue, you have to talk about it in a neutral and objective manner, and you have to present both sides which sounds reasonable. I think most of us would agree with that because you know you have to have an idea that has to fight for it in the marketplace of ideas. But our school board decided uh, that what they wanted to do was to, be, to just do away with that and allow issues to be framed where you have certain things that they believe there should be non-controversial, which dealing with race or for whatever reason they thought that what wasn't going to be controversial, and they would basically say they're going to have one side, and a lot of parents are fighting backing at this. And may I remind you that some of these people have been done, done such an incompetent job uh, within office that when they start purging people from their own Democratic Party, uh, people are going to start looking for alternatives, which is why you're seeing what's happened in Northern Virginia. Ha why, why what happened in Virginia happened, um, particularly if you look at like uh, Youngkin's election. Most of those people were basically people that got kicked out of their own Democratic Party. Um, the proposed use that they're having because of the increasing criticism that we've seen is that they now want to create and hire a vendor that actually has no limits on data collection or searches. Anyone see an issue with that? Yeah. Or how about Deke Scams on dark web searches? Now, <laughs> what that means, that means that basically well, 90 per, a lot of the data, 90% of your intelligence is unclassified, and you can find a lot of people when you find stuff that's not uh, publicly available on open web searches. So you can hire, you can pay for a service, you can find out uh, metadata, you should be used to crawling for metadata when you're trying to find, find information about somebody. Use of all source data, is that what the question, or is it? Okay, all source data intelligence means any type of source of information. So, and I'll go into this. For example, what information is your child reporting to you? Is reporting to the teacher. There have been cases in Fairfax County where a child has complained about their parents getting on their case about doing their homework and a teacher going ahead and reporting to Child Protective Services that there's homework pressure and they, they, visit, and they visit their house. So there's also like a culture war going on in Fairfax County particularly on the Asian community, which typically, Fairfax, we're a little extra when it comes to education. Like a lot of people, nobody moves to Fairfax because they love the weather. That just doesn't happen, right? Because traffic is, like our traffic is worse than yours. 
like is is bad. Like we're only we compete with LA for traffic. Um, all source data could also be what what could be what could be reported from other parents. The problem is that because they're developing this capability and they're immature, they don't vet their sources and they're not adhering to any type of oversight, which the intelligence community certainly has to do and has been held to account during the Church and Pike committees. Um, so this kind of goes into some of these uh, abuses of power, um, warrantless wiretapping we've seen since 9-11. Um, you've seen growing, surve growing surveillance societies, such as the invest FBI's investigative data warehouse. The Patriot Act, uh, the Real ID, the no-fly list, which is still a problem. You can get easily to get on that list, but hard to get off when you get vetted. You know, everyone familiar? Some, some of these seem familiar. Uh, and number six, uh, we can talk about the attacks on academic freedom. So this kind of goes like through a history here. We look at this RFP. I'm just looking at my time. You can see up here the Church and Pike Committees. Uh, McCarthyism, where they wanted to go after um, suspected uh, subversives, communists. CIA during the Nixon era and under Bush administration, the, the, the surveillance state grew exponentially within this country. Uh, and it's been leveraged by subsequent administrations since. So let's talk about this RFP and why she should be scared about this. I mentioned that Fairfax, Fairfax County can serve as a test bed what other school districts around the country can use. So this RFP, and I actually published an article about this, and I'll show you the impact that it's had. Uh, the first one, it goes through all, actually I'll back up here. This RFP literally goes through all five steps of the intelligence collection process, from planning direction, collection, processing and exploitation, analysis and production, which is where the real, subject of abuse can happen and dissemination. The speaker before me had mentioned before that humans can understand a narrative, but however, if you politicize intelligence or if you start layering, if you start having biases such as layering, mirror imaging, or a hurting type of bias, really bad things can happen, particularly on who you share that, that analysis with, because it's, you're, support, you're saying that you're supported with data. Uh, in step one, we talked about with planning directions where vendors have to show the ability to define assets such as persons, brands, facilities, and products. And when they talk about a brand, this can mean anything from groups, facilities, to students, to the school district's reputation and name. Let me tell you how ridiculous this, how absurd this is. If you're in the intelligence community, like if you're in law enforcement, what's the threshold before you can collect on a target, right? If probable cause? You have to have probable cause to start collecting. What's the, what's the threshold in the intelligence community, which is a much lower threshold? It just has to abide by your mission. The only thing that really gets you in trouble is if you collect on a US person, or a five-eye citizen, or a person who's a green card holder, or in the, or in the United States. And because if you start doing that, you better be able to tie it directly to whatever mission you're trying to do. If you're doing some counterterrorism support, it has to tie to that. And you, can't, and you can only keep it for a specified period of time. And you can't have a record of collection where you can refer to it back again. If it's a brand, that's a lot of it is a political initiative. Now, Fairfax, I mean, most people could probably agree with some political initiatives. But what happens if you go to other areas of the country, right? You know, think like Texas, Oklahoma, you know. It, it can get it can get pretty or Mississippi. It could be this could this could get this could get abused. Um, the protecting the bank include initiatives, agendas, and information that could embarrass FCPS or school board members. This is why you have whistleblowing. You're not supposed to classify information just because it can cause embarrassment. That's why you actually. As, I mean, I think we all agree on that. So if you have something that's embarrassing to a school board member because it's complete incompetence. They want to actually to know about it. Um, the vendors could build indicators and warnings. Now, actually, I've actually, I've actually worked in INW in the Pentagon. So uh, intelligence working must be able to save queries and set alerts for active listening, so interaction with your targets. With collection, to have the ability to scan deep and dark web sources not visible through traditional uh, web searches, such as OSINT. Seem like a privacy violation? This is actually happening. It's going on right now. Uh, calls for the ability to collect data beyond what is voluntarily provided. So when I'm an attache and I'm a, when I was in Morocco 
everyone knew that all of us were intelligence officers, and what they provided to us, they knew they were for providing that freely to the government. Now, if you're going between overt or what's not voluntary, you're now dealing with what's known as covert collection, not clandestine, but covert. You're not identifying your identity of what you're collecting. Over collection could be the crawling of social media platforms, email addresses, association of information with aliases to identify individuals, dealing with social nodal network analysis, identifying your relationships with other individuals. Find, essentially, they want to know which parents are complaining about them the most and identifying their true perso their cyber personas and associating it with true names. Um, also, with integration with the FCP, with our student information system. This is the information that your student is available on your student, whether if they have whatever disciplinary records, and even using your, your own kid as a collector against you if they're reporting something. And, oh, this is what, this is, this is what gets me, and this is what should scare mostly all of you. The vendor's free to use any data source anonymously. And that goes, act, that directly goes to covert collection. So if you use, like, for example, a company like, let's say, Palantir. Anyone have heard of Palantir? You've heard of Palantir, right? They use, like, their own proprietary software methods. They have a, it's kind of almost like Starlight, you know, like on steroids. I mean, they're able to basically to use and, and scrape uh, unstructured data and, per, and create through, uh, visual images and, and so, uh, for associations. And if you're using any data source, how can you challenge as a parent on who they sh on who they share this information with? And let me remind you, a lot of our school board members actually have and work with like activists that support whatever agenda that they have. We can talk about the exploitation, where you talk about false reduction rate with embedded violence. Um, this is trying to establish true names rather than cyber personas, so they're not really doing anything to vet the accuracy of what's being reported. For example, when you deal with an intelligence committee, we deal with what's known as an IIR, an intelligence information report. It's unvetted intelligence. Whenever you have a source, you're supposed to vet and validate that source for its accuracy. And you're supposed to use all source and multiple methods to validate what you're, to, to support your assessment. It's a crystal ball. Intelligence is never perfect. This is another problem. Like, they're not being perfect with this, with, 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 this, pros with this product. And their analysis and production. This is to visually identify relationships and connections between persons. This is all within the request for proposal. And the ability to have a customizable report on a disparate data seat, multiple origin points to produce a high level summary. And the ability to provide a custom report to disparate data set with multiple origin points to produce a high level summary. This allows them, for example, a potential abuse is that if you are politicizing a particular parent that you really don't like, you can put together basically a human targeting package and you can present it to you, whatever your local law enforcement and then see what actions, what actionable, th uh, what for them to take action on it. Potential for abuse? Absolutely. Particularly if you're not having, if it doesn't adhere to any type of analytic standards, it's not subject to any type of oversight. Um, this kind of helps with my other potential abuses. Um, who's reported? How is it presented? Does it meet Intelligence Community Directive 203 Analytic Standards compliant? Probably not. You know, if you're in the intelligence community, it takes about eight years to become a subject matter expert, to be a competent analyst, to know actually subject matter. Now you're just going to throw this open source capability in the school districts because you're not liking the criticism you're receiving from parents. Um, and just to help you to kind of uh, going back, like, for example, in Loudoun County, that earlier uh, photo that I showed, they actually had a school district where... School district officials were in a fa secret Facebook site collecting information on parents that were criticizing them. Um, one was a gym teacher that spoke out, you know, they had criticized whatever transgender thing. Just, you know, people exercising their First Amendment rights. Um, and then you had the September 21st uh, National School Board Association where um, they wanted to invoke the Patriot Act against parents. Now that was interesting. Like, I am on the ground level. At the time, I'm working in Quantico. I'm directly supporting the chief security officer. I quick, I immediately self-reported that one. I said, guys, I'm going to be showing up on this one. And you think that that was scary? Like, if you look at that memo, it directed the FBI to set up a special task force to work with law enforcement and to set up dedicated architectures to actually look into these threats. Now, mind you, there was absolutely no reporting on actually a true threat 
that would merit a, nat a national capability. Certainly none that would ever exceed the capabilities of what local law enforcement would happen. Well, I mean, he got a letter from the National School Board Association. Merrick Garland decided to write a letter. You know, and also remember, Merrick Garland's son-in-law also runs Panorama Education. So, like, there's, there's a bunny connection there, too. But, you know, there was the outrage from parents when that happened, and you saw a lot of states immediately separate themselves from the NBSA. If you're, what federal? None. Absolutely no federal law that you're breaking. What's that? Well, no, there's a lot of parents. Like, they, they, they really fucked up in D.C. Like, they, well, they picked a fight with, like, parents. Like I said, like, so many of us are, like, in the IC and law enforcement and DOD communities. Like, we're not taking this. You know, and, like, and then when you kick us out, like, we move there because, one, it's diverse. Two, the school district's really good. And it's like, and we start seeing this kind of crap go on. Like, most of us have been in, like, in, in areas and in high threat environments. A lot of us have been in countries in high threat environments and we kind of recognize this type of behavior so we're I mean we're gonna we're gonna start giving it back um, so this kind of goes into like the, this slide like how most of us felt like mostly all of us like we were really happy we were comfortable this is why we moved to Fairfax right and then things like kind of like changed in, like the last two years we're just kind of like all right this is this has gone to this has gone on far enough uh, this has happened in other areas of the country like in Michigan uh, you had Michigan school board members that were having uh, collecting dossiers on parents, um, and this one, this one from Michigan, this was when they were monitoring the social media accounts of parents. I'm sorry, Arizona was when they were collecting dossiers on parents. Can you imagine sending your kids to school and you have a question? All of a sudden, you're finding out that your name is you're being in a database. They're collecting it on you. And it's not just one kid. What if you have multiple kids? How many have more than one kid in the school system? Yeah, they're collecting a lot of information about you when, the, when, this, is com when this is coming through. Um, so with the takeaways, um, anybody with this capability could be deemed a threat to the brand. So if you're a mouthy parent at a PTA meeting, and they <laughs> will come after you at PTA meetings, uh, can be subject to an apparatus that's supported by a you know, billion dollar war chest. Uh, we talked about the NBSA. We talked about, I mentioned before, the Loudoun County. Uh, within schools across the country, other school districts that use social media monitoring. However, it hasn't been modified to expand the collection capability beyond students. Um, some other issues dealing with, if you do have this apparatus, how secure is the system really? We talked about some of the cybersecurity incidents in 2016 within the U.S., on the average, there's about two school districts every day are popped with like ransomware or some other incident. Um, when I did a FOIA on, at my local school board, I found out that one, they don't have a log retention policy. They don't have an encryption of data at rest or in transit policy. Uh, again, like a, working in the federal government, like some of us, there was a speaker earlier at this conference about executive order uh, 14028, which is having a huge impact. Um, there is hope. We have the uh, child, children's online privacy protection rule, or how are they going to be protecting this type of information? Prohibitions against mandatory collection, user prohibitions, retention, and security. And, well, I'm going to have actually time here to, to answer about questions for 10 minutes. So I did actually blow the whistle on this one. Uh, I actually did publish uh, this article and my findings back in March. And an update on how this had an impact is that they pulled the RFP. They pulled the request for proposal. And then they republished it. But when they republished it, they didn't put any details as to what they want to use, as, as, as what they want for requesting from vendors. Um, I mentioned before, you said, like, who's got the balls to, to fight these people? So um, like, I'm, I'm a group of a lot of pissed off parents. And what we ended up doing, we ended up uh, creating our own shadow board. <laughs> so it's, think of this like as Mystery Science Theater 3000, <laughs> where we actually stream our school board meetings and we actually have, we get we get reports from other teachers and other parents, and we we are putting them on blast, 
Like it is, it is raw. And then we have like in this one, we keep a we keep a Zoom meeting. We allow everyone to come. I mean, if you're going to start limiting comment, and we this idea exploded when one of our school board members said we're going to eliminate public comment because it's not conducive to our agenda. And we're just, oh, I know, I hear you. Once we heard that, we're like, not happening today, buddy. Um, so we just we launched this, and even on our second episode, we actually have four times as many views as the actual school school board stream. <laughs> so, yeah, it's 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 interesting down in uh, what's going on uh, in Virginia. Here's my contact information. You know, I've got a Gmail. I mean, I'm pretty open to social. If people want to contact me. So I'll leave some of this open for questions. Somebody's got a question about uh, what's going on down there and elsewhere. Yes, sir. Yes, they are. Well, that's a great question. Are we looking at it at higher levels? Well, right now I've got a 15, 14 year old and a 16 year old, which is I guess why I drink. But, um, <laughs> but we are looking to expand. We actually are helping other parents set up their own shadow boards to understand what their school board members are doing. And you're right. Um, most of these are the lowest level officials and it's unfortunate because in my view, like the school board, of, school board races are probably the most important because they're impacting your students' lives. Um, we're in, in this case, like we're not giving them any place to hide. We actually have like retiree and volunteers actually showing up the working session, work session meetings. We actually so we can actually hear in real time what the, what they're pro, what they're thinking and their what's and the matters that are integral to the th decision making process. And for those like for Fairfax, it might be like like also in the similar in other school districts, a school board member. If more than two of them meet, they actually have to call a meeting, so they can't just meet in secret when they talk when they talk about their. Yeah, they're not liking this. And this, and we actually had an impact on the last school board meeting because they weren't expecting. We had an older gentleman who's retired. He's like, "Hey, I got all the time in the world. What do you want me to do?" And we like, "We want you to go to their all their their retreat, all their their uh, their offsite, their retreat, as well as their school, as well as their um, their work session." Now, before this year, they used to actually put the recordings of their work sessions, and then because like a lot of they're getting a lot of heat, they decided to no longer do that and just publish minutes. And we're like, okay, are these minutes really like accurate? So they're like, why don't you show up there? And uh, he did. The guy, the gentleman's name is Mark, and they wanted to push in like an incident, a bias incident accountability program, which you're kind of like, well, what does that mean? Well, it's very generic, it's overly broad and vague of like how you can report like any type of instance of a microaggression or a bias. But you're like, okay, well, is there like any type of reasonable person standard, or is there any type of compelling interest? And like, they really couldn't art articulate that. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. That's 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 horrible, and that's what that's why you have these programs that are out there to identify that and to intervene. Well, I'm not uh, criticizing the intent between identifying mental distress or a violent behavior. What I'm criticizing is the expansion to the word brand. Before, yeah, totally see, so yeah, problematic. We weren't talking about like harm, bullying, 
uh, or aggressions towards a, or any type of demographic or group. Like, that's not even on the table. Like, everyone agrees with that in the Venn diagram. We're talking about, like, once you start talking about a brand image or now you no longer have an, or even a process in place of analytic standards if you have a problem with a parent, because some parents get problematic, um, and you have no means for how you're going to share the information, who do you share the information with, how long do you retain that information? For example, if you're a parent who has multiple children through the school system, you can collect a lot of information on that parent. And parents have gotten harassed where, even like at our school board meetings, like we've had parents who have had, uh, who've been threatened, who've, who've been assaulted, uh, who have had their cars egged. I mean, we've, I mentioned about being doxxed. It's getting to that level in, in, in Virginia. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm running for school board in my area. Like I'm getting rid of these people. Like they gotta go. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're just, we're gonna run for school board and just and take their seats. Cause you, it should never get to that level. Yes. Right. One or the other. So it's interesting in Fairfax, like it's a soup, right? So everyone who's fighting against them, they just want to label us all. Everyone is like right wing. That's that's the immediate label. But then you're kind of like, no, we're, that's not the case. Most of us are are having a real problem with, um, uh, like for example, like parental notification, right? They're like in, like a lot of policies, something could happen with your kid. They're not even going to notify you, and that, that's that's a big problem. I mean, that's, you know, there's, there's an issue with parental rights. Um, so that's what's bringing everyone to part. Now, this is the fight that's bringing everyone together. Now, there might be other issues that will, the group will splinter, and that's likely going to happen. But in this one, the behavior with some of these school board members where they're trying to go, go, at, go after parents and harassing parents, that's just not a working strategy. Yes? How do you find out if your school board is good? Oh, FOIAs. FOIA, FOIA, FOIA. Um, <laughs> We've, and some of them will actually complain about FOIAs. Um, but you know you can FOIA another person's FOIA as well. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Yes? Can FOIA be used on non-governmental records? Is there a PTA non-governmental? No. PTA is a different organization. Um, so, uh, if it's, uh, well, a PTA, well, first of all, you got to understand, like, a PTA, really is kind of powerless, right? They're, kind, they're like, you know, you're supposed to be doing like your, your bake sales, coordinating, volunteering for your parents. They're supposed to allow for advocacy for parents, though they will they will actively try to suppress that in some cases. If you, what's that? It is, dude, Google my name. Google, Google me. Like, I was like, with the, the war I got into with the Virginia PTA, dude, like, like, yeah, it is controlled opposition. There's a reason why there's that T in there. You can't you can't take a position that's uh, that's contrary to any pr uh, published position paper that they have. Um, as far as the techniques that you can use, if it's a Virginia PTA member, e you would FOIA the the emails of the school board member, and if they had a communication with a PT uh, the PTA official, that that's how you typically would find it. Yes. Absolutely. That's uh, that's why we're that's why we're actually going to have we're we're actually put up a schedule where we're going to be rotating and showing up at all their work session meetings. So like when they want to have like a re the bad idea fairy show up, like there's going to be a, a rally outside the school board. They're going to and they're going to see it happen. Like this is just the you know think about it, like all these school board meetings. Like it literally has become like protest rally. Like I've never you know like I'm in my 40s. Like I would never see this in like it was like I was in college or something like that. Any other? What do you think the value? I'm, as a rule, I'm generally opposed to the idea of doing any kind of programmatic social media surveillance, even if it's in the name of trying to identify potential threats and, and all that jazz. I guess I'm just curious what you would, what the, what the value is of having those automated systems there versus just making sure that you have the capacity and the ability to do retroactive, like if 
someone makes an accusation, like I was bullied by this person on Twitter, and they make threats against me on Twitter, um, having the ability to go in and archive those tweets versus having a bot create the social media proactively. I don't see the need for that second one if you're just having a threat. No, I, I, I would agree with you. If you're having somebody who's being threatened, I mean, you should be able to look at it uh, be able to perform like if it is like a true like a bias incident because that that would certainly like escalate like how you would respond to that or, or remediate that issue um, but yeah but in this case this is actually like trying to control your opposition or criticism like this is and under the guise of like we're trying to protect kids but we're really trying to like you know keep parents in check that's kind of that's that's that I'm hoping that's the takeaway yes Right. Uh, okay. Well, okay. I'll, I'll bring that up. Um, this is a sensitive topic, but for example, in kindergarten, if your, ch if your child wants to uh, change their gender identity, they're not, they're not going to notify the parents in kindergarten. And that's in training material. I think most parents would want to know if their child's going through some sort of identity crisis or if they're having gender fluidity, they wouldn't want to intervene. They would want to be, a, they would want to be there or most parents would want to support. Now, there, you're going to have the one-offs where some parents aren't supportive, and that should be handled on an individual basis, yeah, right, but. To, um, like, there are some children who are going along with the parents Well, then you, then you, do you handle that, right? If it's, if it's, if it's abusive, right? Then you, 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 you handle that appropriately, but I, does the policy work if you're just going to say for across the board, you're not going to, not going to involve the parent? Because you do have some parents that are going to even intervene and support their children. So, so why wouldn't you bring in those people in the support network? It takes a village to raise a child. Okay. Yeah. Well, you mentioned very early on. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, so one more question. Yeah. Okay. So that's coming from if you're using like your school assets or computers to do like inappropriate usage, like you know if you're using it for like porn or, or for furtherance of a crime, that's you're supposed to have some accountability for that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's and that's why you have this war that's going on, right? Because you're you're creating a lot of distress on parents. Nobody wants to be able to send their kids to a school where they can have where they don't know what's going on. Like that's just stuck on it, it, it. It's creating it creates conflict. Yes, sir.
Oh, I, I am with you on that. I, I'm all for a web portal that you don't have to FOIA that's searchable regarding school policies as well as other FOIAs. So I'm not even, I'm, I, I am all for that. Like, yeah, if you, someone has other FOIA, put that on a portal where if you want to see what other people have FOIA, you can view that. Yes, sir. Oh. That's something I would be very suspicious of because they've got They do, they do. And yeah, I got two minutes. Uh, yeah, I got, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, yeah, when you look at like the Randy Guard, that's a great question. Um, it, it, it is. And, and, and I would say it's, it's, they don't even support teachers, they support administrators. I mean, if you look at a lot of school districts, they're hiring a lot more administrators, not teachers. Yeah, and uh, there and, and a lot of it's pushing initiatives because it's avoiding accountability. Um, but yeah, I would say there certainly is. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here. I'm going to respect the time. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for allowing me to actually speak before this forum. Uh, love coming to Hope. And uh, all right, thank you.